Okay, let's say a prayer for the second one. I think we need it. Heavenly Father, as we talk about these issues that have eternal consequences, I pray that you will enlighten our minds, that your holy angels will walk up and down these passages, angels that excel in strength, and that we will be able to receive your message from your word so that we may understand the times we are living and the choices that need to be made. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just about the previous lecture, we only spoke about atonement and justification. We didn't speak about sanctification. So don't worry about the fact. Don't think that I'm saying there must be no obedience to God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying justification is by faith alone. Nothing I can do. Even my obedience is Him working in me and not me doing something to grain brownie points. So, and even my faith is His. But now, the sad bit. Of course, the joint doc declaration on justification is not the only document that the Protestants have signed. They have signed other documents. And all of these documents had to be ready and signed before the 31st of October of this year. And so we must find out what the points of agreement were. And I don't have time to go into the full detail because I'd keep you here for weeks. They've been working on this for 50 years. And I'm trying to tell you in one lecture what they did. Now, in my series, it's two lectures. So I'm leaving out a lot. But I'm just giving you the gist. And the gist should be enough. It starts off by Pope calling for all religions to unite. Now, this is a very serious issue. All religions are to unite. And he made this call in March 2013. And within just less than a year, they all decided to do that. And so on the 18th of September, 17th to 18th of September 2014, the World Alliance of Religions Summit was held in Seoul, the Republic of Korea, hosted by the Heavenly Culture World Peace Restoration and Light Summit. And there they signed the Unity of Religion Agreement. Over 2,000 people signed the peace agreement Transcending nationality, race, and religion, religions need to unite as one, and an international law for the cessation of wars must be enacted. The top politicians of the world, the leaders of the world, signed a document, and the religious leaders signed a document in which they stated, we all serve the same God. We all serve the same God. But we just saw that Islam teaches that Jesus is not the Son of God, that Allah does not even have a son. So how can Allah, who doesn't have a son, be the same God as my God, who is manifest in the Son? How is that possible? Because if I've seen Jesus, I've seen the Father. And there they celebrated in the stadium, we are one. Now I have a whole lecture where this is dealt with, so we don't have to go to the details. 1 John 2.23 says, Whoever denies the Son, the same is not the Father. He that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So Jesus is always the pivotal point around which all of these things revolve. Pope Francis said, Religion should not be confined to personal conscience. Are we going back to the Middle Ages? Is this insanity or what is this? The orderly development of a civil pluralistic society requires that the authentic spirit of religion not be confined to personal conscience, but that its significant role in the construction of society is recognized, said Pope Francis in his remarks to the Italian president. So the church is going to decide for me what I may believe. This is a very, very serious time in which we are living. 
Pope condemns religious fundamentalism. And I've read this before, but I'll read it again. A fundamentalist group, even if it kills no one, even if it strikes no one, is violent. The mental structure of fundamentalism is violence in the name of God. Pope Francis declares that Christian fundamentalism is a sickness. I wonder what Christian fundamentalism is. Let's get a dictionary definition. This is a modern dictionary, dictionary dictionary.com. They say it's a movement in American Protestantism that arose in the early part of the 20th century, which is not really true, in reaction to modernism, that stresses the infallibility of the Bible, not only in matters of faith and morals, but also as a literal historical record, holding as essential to Christian faith beliefs in such doctrines as the creation of the world, the virgin birth, physical resurrection, atonement by the sacrificial death of Christ, and the second coming. If you believe any of those, you're a fundamentalist. Here I stand, I can do no other. I'm a fundamentalist, according to this definition. Now what must happen to me if I am a fundamentalist? Can you see why the atonement is there? Because Catholicism denies the atonement. And if you... and. Uh, Bishop Tutu said, surely you don't believe that Christ received an ecclesiastical lift and went up into heaven. It never happened. The Jesus seminar said he didn't, he didn't rise from the dead. He was probably eaten by dogs. I mean, what kind of theology is that that is being taught in the world today? It's a disease to be a fundamentalist, according to the Pope. It's a sickness. Now, what must happen to fundamentalists? Whether they be Muslims, now, you know, people think a fundamentalist is someone who straps bombs to himself and blows people up. But not according to this. Even if it strikes no one, even if it harms no one, if it has this ideology, it's a problem. What must happen to people like that? Well, here is Colonel T.H. Hamas speaking at the Center of Asymmetric Warfare in Georgetown University. What kind of university is that? That's a Jesuit university. So here is a gathering to discuss these things in a Jesuit university. And let's hear what this man has to say. It's unbelievable. External actors have to be eliminated. These guys who are coming in are the most dangerous of all because they're true believers. And true believers, whether they're Muslim, they're Christian, or they're Marine, are dangerous people because there is no other way other than their way. And you've got to either, you've got to eliminate them. Hmm. Did you get that? True believers are dangerous people, whether they are Muslim, Christian, or Marine, which means whether even in the military. If they are a true believer, they believe there's no other way than their way. And therefore you have to eliminate them. Now, if I'm a true believer and I say there's no other way than Jesus, then I'm an offense to all the other religions. And if I cling to that view, and then I still say, nobody comes to the Father except by Him. There's no other name under heaven and earth whereby you can be saved except the name Christ Jesus. If I rattle those off, well, then I guess I have to be eliminated, right? Pope Francis calls for unity between evangelicals, Catholics, and he says division is the work of the devil. He urges Lutherans to set aside doctrine to work together. Did Tony Palmer say the same thing? God will sort out the doctrine when we come upstairs? Well, that's fascinating. Francis urged Lutherans to set aside doctrinal differences Thursday to work with Catholics to care for the poor, the sick, the refugees as he laid up his vision for a greater communion before his visit to Sweden later this month where he made the same call. Set aside doctrine. Get rid of it. We don't need doctrine. We've got enough poor people to take care of. Isn't the gospel spreading the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ? Is this a social gospel that we have now? Is doctrine important? 1 Timothy 4.16 Take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. 
Romans 16, 17, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Titus 2, 1, But speak ye things which become of sound doctrine, till I come. 1 Timothy 4, 13, Give attendance to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. 2 John 1, 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not these things which we have wrought, but that we receive full reward. Whoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Who must I believe now, the Pope or the Bible? I have a choice. Catholics and Lutherans signed joint declaration accepting common path. The leaders of the world, Catholic and Lutherans, have signed the joint declaration at an ecumenical prayer service. Pope and President of the Lutheran World Federation signed joint statement. Unity call on the Reformation anniversary. So here is the Archbishop of Canterbury, Canterbury saying, 50th anniversary of discussions between the Anglicans and them, and we need unity. We need a joint declaration issued after the service. The two leaders said that they were undeterred from seeking unity between the two denominations. We need unity. Here is a book that lists all the apparitions of Mary and the so-called statements of Mary. And one of them is, the Queen proclaims that there will come a time when all Christendom will be reunified under the Roman Church. And Pope Pius made a prediction in 1878 where he said, We expect that the Immaculate Virgin and Mother of God, Mary, through her most powerful intercession, will bring it about that our Holy Mother, the Catholic Church, will gain in influence from day to day amongst all nations and in all places, prosper and rule from ocean to ocean, from the great stream to the ends of the earth, and that she will enjoy peace and liberty. There will be one fold and one shepherd. This is what Rome has been striving for all the time. And 2017 is the great jubilee year. Pope at Charismatic Rally and Stadium invites them to the Vatican, and he says, this is your jubilee year? Fifty years since the Catholic Charismatic movement started in 1967 at the Duquesne University when a whole lot of Catholic prelates started speaking in tongues and even Pope Paul VI spoke in tongues. Fifty years. Pentecost is a celebration of unity in diversity. So that was the celebration that was held at Rome as a consequence. But there's another jubilee. It's the 100th anniversary of the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima in 2017. So have we have a jubilee and another jubilee and another jubilee. Can you remember how excited Kenneth Copeland was yesterday about all these jubilees? You know what? Do we look at certain dates or do we look at events unfolding in the Bible? In the Bible? That's what we're looking at. So here they celebrated that. And the Pope went there on the 13th of May this year. And they had to close the border because all of these hordes of people came to Fatima. And what happened there? The Pope prayed at the graves of the children that uh, supposedly received the apparition and then declared them to be saints. Which is wonderful because now their merit is available and can be distributed to you. If you have a shortfall, then you know you have access to something. But the great jubilee, of course, is the 2017 celebration of the 500 years of Reformation. In the year 2008, there was an interview with the Jesuit professor Edward Kinman. Now look who he was. He was general secretary of the Netherlands Bishops' Conference. And he said the following, There remains hardly any reason to remain a Protestant. He saw Protestantism as an action group that forgot to dissolve itself. That's quite mean. 
and a group that had not recognized the significance of a global visible leadership personality such as the Pope. And he stated that he doubted that the Reformation would still exist after 2017 and that the Protestants should return to the Mother Church. 2017 has been in their mind for a long, long time. They're working feverishly to get it done before the 31st of October. Religious news services said they had uh, decided to bury the hatchet. They said the fact that the struggle for this truth in the 16th century led to a loss of unity in the Western Christendom belongs to the dark pages of church history. 2017, we must confess openly that we have been guilty before Christ of damaging the unity of the church. I thought the Dark Ages were because of Roman Catholicism and this idea that God was this wrathful deity that was going to fry you for eternity and even if your sins were forgiven, you were going to roast in purgatory until they were burnt off unless the Pope came to your help. I thought that was the Dark Ages. And then they got together and they put together this document from conflict to you communion. It was signed by the Lutheran World Federation and the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. And they want full visible unity of the church. Now, I'm interested in what they wrote in this document. It's a very long document and you can study it. And in fact, they ask you to study it. I took them at their word and I read it. The fact that the struggle for this truth in the 16th century led to the loss of unity in Western Christendom belongs to the dark pages, as we read. In 2017, we must confess openly that we've been guilty before Christ of damaging the unity of the church. Two challenges, purification and healing of memories and restoration of church unity. The Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity has taken seriously the words of the Pope that the things that unite us are greater than the things that divide us. 2017 will see the first centennial commemoration of the Reformation to take place during the ecumenical age. It will mark 50 years of Lutheran-Roman Catholic dialogue. Isn't it interesting that all these negotiations are exactly one jubilee? Do you think it's planned? These people work according to an occult agenda. Lutherans and Catholics have been able to reinterpret their theological traditions and practices, recognizing the influence they had on each other. I wonder whether that is so. Because if the Pope is infallible, surely he cannot change? And then it says Pentecostal and other charismatic movements are powerful movements that have put forward a new emphasis that have made many of the old confessional controversies obsolete. It has brought together communalities and they will play a significant role in the observance of Reformation in 2017. Why? Because doctrine's not important. If you have the same experience as I have, well then we're one, doesn't matter. Does it matter that uh, voodoo priests fall over and are slain in the spirit and speak in tongues? Do they take that into account? Are they then of the same spirit when they want to sacrifice little children and throw them into a volcano and see them burn? Is that the same spirit? Well, it's the same experience. What happened now? Listen to this rhetoric. This is absolutely brilliant. This is their joint document. What happened in the past cannot be changed, but what is remembered of the past and how it is remembered can. With the passage of time, indeed, change. Remembrance makes the past present. While the past itself is unalterable, the presence of the past in the present is alterable. In view of 2017, the point is not to tell a different history, but to tell that history differently. Have you ever read such gobbledygook in all your life? This is total Jesuit rhetoric. I'm going to tell you a different history. 
I'm not going to tell you a different history. I'm just going to tell you the, different, the history differently so that you forget the history. Unbelievable. The breakthrough for Catholic scholarship came when they realized that Luther overcame within himself a Catholicism that wasn't fully Catholic. So what they're saying is they realized Martin Luther didn't understand Catholicism. No, he understood it too well. That was the problem. Now let's have a look at their joint decisions. We've already discussed the big one, the Joint Declaration on Justification. We did a whole lecture on that. We've already discussed the other big one, atonement. Massive differences. But now look at this. Luther understood the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as a testamentum. He emphasized his belief that Christ gives himself body and blood that are really present. Faith does not make Christ present. You see, Rome teaches that the sacrifice of the Mass is a complete in reenactment of the sacrifice on the cross. And that that host is the literal body of Christ. Remember my story when I was waiting for the Catholic priest to forgive me my sins and I was looking at the host and it was the Corpus Christi, it was the body, but because it's dead I can't speak to him, I need to speak to a priest. Now it's true that Martin Luther was a Catholic priest before he was a Protestant. And it is true that a Catholic priest will be totally involved in the Mass and that Martin Luther struggled with the concept, is it really the body or is it not the body? Is it just a memory or is it not? Most of the Protestant world accepted that it was a symbol. But Martin Luther did struggle in the beginning and he, and he did make compromises. In their common understanding, they write, in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, is present wholly and entirely in his body and blood under the signs of bread and wine. Uh, I think I'm going to have a heart attack. A joint statement by Lutherans and Catholics. The common statement affirms all the essential elements of faith and the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ without adopting the conceptual terminology of transubstantiation. That is so deceptive. That is so wicked. You see, Rome calls this transformation of the host transubstantiation. The substance is changed from bread into the literal body of Jesus Christ. Protestantism denied that. Now they say, we agree that it is the body, but we won't use the word transubstantiation because that irritates some. Isn't that deceptive? That is horrendous. Evangelical Lutherans overwhelmingly vote to approve declaration of unity with the Roman Catholics. This came a few years later. Then the evangelical Catholics uh, Lutherans in the United States, they came together and they also signed a document which had to be ready, of course, before the 31st of October. And this declaration was approved with a vote, it's called Declaration on the Way, with a vote of 931 to 9. That scares me. 931 delegates voted that the document signed jointly by the Rome and the Evangelical Lutherans could be accepted. I'd like to know some of the things that stand in that document, wouldn't you? Well, some people didn't agree. Mike Gendron didn't. He said, by seeking unity with the Catholic religion, they are departing from the biblical faith of the Reformers. He told Christian News Word Network, they need to know that there can never be biblical unity between Roman Catholics and denominations which uphold the gospel of God. And he noted several integral, fundamental differences between evangelicals and Roman Catholics. The Bible teaches justification by faith. Catholicism condemns with anathema those who believe in justification is by faith alone. The Bible teaches we are born again by the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. Catholicism teaches regeneration is by the waters of baptism. 
The Bible teaches we are purified of sin by the blood of Jesus. Catholicism teaches purification is by the fires of purgatory. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. Catholicism offers many mediators, including Mary and its priests. And this is contrary to the scriptures. Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, after this document, said, Dear sisters and brothers, I know that's fashionable, but whatever happened to brothers and sisters? Let us pause to honor this historic moment, Eaton said, though we have not yet arrived, we have claimed that we are in fact on the way to unity. After 500 years of division and 50 years of dialogue, all these jubilees, this action must be understood in the context of other significant agreements we have reached, most notably the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. So here is the new document. It's given out like this. It says Declaration on the Way. And then it has Jesus with the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, now representing Protestantism and Catholicism coming together. All right? So what are they going to talk about? Let's look at them. Let, let's look at the doctrine. Catholics and Lutherans also agree that the office of ministry stands over and against gegen über the community as well as within it, and thus is called to exercise authority over the community. That's exactly what the Pope says. Your religion is not subject to personal conscience. Who will decide for you what you must believe? The church. This is back to the Middle Ages. Agreement on the Eucharist. This is Protestantism agreeing with Catholicism. Lutherans and Catholics agree that in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ himself is present. He is truly present, substantially, as a person. And he is present in his entirety as the Son of God and a human being. So the Mass is a reenactment of the sacrifice of the cross. The church is, as well, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the sanctifier. I, th I think I'm going to have another heart attack. Who's the sanctifier? Jesus is the sanctifier. Who becomes the sanctifier now? The church becomes the sanctifier. Who's been replaced here? Lutherans and Catholics today, notice this. This is their document. I'm not making this up, my dear friends. Lutherans and Catholics today mutually recognize at a fundamental level the presence of apostolicity in our tradition. Let's read what Martin Luther had to say on that. This comes from the journal Christianity Today. This used to be Billy Graham's magazine. They're quoting Martin Luther. On the heels of his understanding on justification, they say, To Luther, the church was no longer the institution defined by apostolic succession. Instead, it was the community of those who had been given faith. Salvation came not by the sacraments as such, but by faith. What did the Lutherans just sign? That they recognize apostolicity? What does that exactly mean? That the power of Peter, the keys, was handed down through the ages, and who has them now in his hands? The Pope. So this is recognizing the power of the Pope rather than the power of Christ to be your sanctifier. Their document, Luther contributed to this insight when he insisted that a manifold Christian substance must be recognized in the Roman Catholic Church, apostolicity. For he perceived there, where? In the church. The true Holy Scriptures, true baptism, true sacrament of the altar, true keys of forgiveness of sins, true office of proclamation, 
true catechism. Where? In the Roman Catholic Church. Excuse me, did Martin Luther teach that the true scriptures, the true baptism, the true sacrament of the altar, the true creeds of forgiveness of sins, the true office of proclamation, and the true catechism were in the Catholic Church? Did he teach that? He might have taught that when he was a Catholic priest, but he certainly didn't teach it when he became a Protestant. The proclaimed gospel has a primacy amongst the mediations of communion in Christ and its benefits, but he receiving it in faith entails as well receiving the sacramental practices of baptism. So now they're going to the Catholic doctrine that you receive your justification when? In baptism. Is this Protestant doctrine now or is it Catholic doctrine that they're agreeing to? It's Catholic doctrine. All of it so far. All as administered by those called to the ministry of the word and sacrament. So who administers it? The church. The church. Lutheranism is gone. What did Martin Luther say? That the true gospel, the true scriptures, the true forgiveness was in the Catholic Church? No, I'll read to you what Martin Luther said. Nothing else than the kingdom of Babylon and the very Antichrist. For who is the man of sin and the son of perdition? But he who who by his teaching and his ordinances increases the sin and perdition of souls in the church. While he yet sits in the church as if he were God. All these conditions have now for many ages been fulfilled by the papal tyranny. Quote, Martin Luther. Did he believe the true gospel was in Rome? Yes or no? Absolutely not. How can they put that in that joint document? How can they do that? History of the Reformation, Abigny, one of the best books on the history of the Reformation. Luther proved by the revelation of Daniel and John and the epistles of Paul and Peter and Jude that the reign of Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy and all the people say, Amen. The holy terror sees their souls. It was Antichrist whom they beheld seated on the pontifical throne. This new idea which derived greater strength from the prophetic descriptions launched forth by Luther in the midst of his contemporaries inflicted the most terrible blow on Rome. Has the mortal wound been healed by that document, yes or no? Absolutely. The reformers were so adamant they put it in stone, how they interpreted Daniel chapter 7 and that the papacy was Antichrist. Here's this previous document from conflict to communion, also by the Lutherans and the Pontifical Council in Europe now. The one was in the States, the other one was here. So, where does this lead to now? If that host is literally the body of Christ in substance, then surely that leads to the following question. To the question of the real presence of Jesus Christ and its theological understanding is joined the question of the duration of this presence. And with it, the question of the adoration of Christ present in the sacrament. And then they conclude, Nevertheless, it is not confined only to the moment of reception and that it does not depend on faith of the receiver. (laughs) Apoplectic fit. What are they saying? You see, Rome teaches... That when that house is lifted up, it remains the body of Christ for how long? Forever. It's the body of Christ. And Martin Luther, when he became a Protestant, he first, he struggled with this. This is the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ. Is it a symbol? Is it the body of Christ? The other Christians were saying to him, it's a symbol, Martin, wake up. And Martin said, you know, I'm so steeped in my Catholicism Maybe, maybe for a moment it's the body of Christ and then it goes back to bread. And he called that not transubstantiation, but consubstantiation. 
And for a long time, he held on to the idea of consubstantiation. And here they're saying now, now the question is, how long is this going to be the body of Christ? Because that will determine how long I can pray to it. How long can I adore it? Are you with me? And so they decide that it is not confined only to the moment of reception and that it does not depend on the faith of the receiver. So what have they given up? They've given up the entire doctrine of the one sacrifice on the cross. And by the way, Martin Luther progressed to the point when he adopted the entire concept of Protestantism, that it was merely a symbol, a reminder of the one great sacrifice that Jesus had brought. And they don't put that in that document. So this document is deceptive. It is easy to quote Martin Luther before he was a Protestant. With regard to the issue that was of the greatest importance to the reformers is this Eucharistic sacrifice. It is present as the crucified who died for our sins. He's there. He's literally there. This is a sacrifice. And you must understand that this is now in this document. So let's just ask the Christian courier, what are transubstantiation and consubstantiation? The word transubstantiation derives from the Latin trans and substantia, substance. So the term is employed in Roman Catholic theology to denote the idea that during the ceremony of the Mass, the bread and wine are changed in substance into the flesh and blood of Christ, even though the elements appear to remain the same. This doctrine has no basis in Scripture, but it's in their joint document. There are traces of this dogma in the post-apostolic writings, etc. Anyway, Martin Luther came up with the idea, maybe just for a while there. But then he retracted. And how do we know? Well, the book Table Talk, Tischreden, of Martin Luther gives all his sayings. And he has the following to say. Now this book, who's read the book Table Talk? Anybody read the book Table Talk? Tischreden. Well, I don't know if it's translated into your language, but get it. You have to read this book. You can still get it free off the web. It is the most brilliant book on the planet other than, of course, the Bible. Whereupon they made this report. This man, this book, by the way, was banned by Rome. Anybody found having this book in his possession was killed, burned at the stake. Nicholas von Amstorf, the theologian and friend of Martin Luther, gathered all his sayings and his students and his colleagues, and they put it all together. And then uh, the book disappeared, and later someone found one in the foundation of a building, and it was smuggled to England, and there it was translated into English. And the English reformers didn't like Martin Luther's idea of consubstantiation. But when they found that he retracted it here, they published it. So the history is whereupon they made a report dated the 10th of November 1646 that they found it to be an excellent divine work. This is the Parliament of England, which was Protestant, worthy of the light in publishing, especially in regard that Luther in the said discourses did revoke his opinion, which he formerly held, touching consubstantiation in the sacrament. So now let's read what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said in Table Talk, even so, we must let the words of Christ remain and speak of the sacrament in suis terminus in their terms with such words as Christ used and spoke. Do this must not be turned into offer this. So what did Martin Luther say? It's not a sacrifice. What does the joint document say? It's a sacrifice. What signifies it to dispute? This is Martin Luther. What signifies it to dispute and wrangle about the abominable idolatry of elevating the sacrament on high to show it to the people? 
This had no appropriation with the fathers, was introduced only to confirm the error touching the worship thereof, as though bread and wine lost their substance and retained only the form, smell, and taste. This the papists called transubstantiation and darkened the right use of the sacrament. Whereas even in Popedom at Milan and Ambrose's time at the present, they never held or observed in Mass either canon or elevation or the Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord be with you. What is Martin Luther saying? What is it? It's bread. It's bread. It's not a sacrifice. And lifting it up to be adored, what does he call that? An abominable practice. The abominable idolatry. So when they hold the Mass, it's a sacrifice. That's why the Roman Catholic prelate is a priest, because a priest is someone who offers, whereas a Protestant is a minister. In the Old Testament, they were priests because they sacrificed. But by one sacrifice, he has forever made perfect. So a Roman Catholic church is not a church, it's a temple, because there's an altar. And the altar looks something like this, and the Mass takes place. And normally, there are steps leading up to the altar, and it's made of nicely hewn stone. The Bible says, Neither shall they go up to steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered. Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God with whole stones. Thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord. And then it says in Isaiah, The people that provoke me to anger continually to my face, they sacrifice in gardens and burneth incense on altars of bricks. Here was a pagan altar. It was always made of hewn stone. God's altar was never to have hewn stones. Because the stones stand for the character of Christ and you cannot chisel away at his character. His character is perfect. Our character is imperfect. And therefore the stones built into the temple were made of hewn stones because Peter says, you are the temple of the living God. You are living stones built into the temple but they had to be squared and made ready because we are imperfect. We need hewing. But Christ, none of it. All Catholic altars are hewn stone and go up by steps contrary to God's command and the lifting up and the veneration of the host Martin Luther called an abominable idolatry. What does the document say? It stays the body and therefore it can be venerated. What has Protestantism come to? It's a Catholic religion. They're no longer Protestant. Here is the basic Catholic doctrine. You can see this is Catholic webpage. The Mass is a true and proper sacrifice which is offered to God. By these words, do this in commemoration of me, Christ made the apostles priests. Moreover, he decreed that they and other priests should offer his body and blood. The sacrifice of the Mass is not merely an offering of praise and thanksgiving or simply a memorial of the sacrifice on the cross. It is a propitiatory sacrifice which is offered for the living and the dead. For the remission of sins and punishment due to sin, as satisfaction for sin and for other necessities. What has Protestantism now done? They have given up the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This was the burning of John Rogers. Do you know who John Rogers was? Who knows who he was? He was a martyr. What, what was he famous for? What did he do? You all know Tyndall, right? Tyndall translated the Bible into English. But he was tied to the stake because he was a priest. He wasn't burnt alive. He was strangled. And then he was burnt at the stake because he was caught before he finished translating the Bible. Who finished the job for him? John Rogers. So we have to thank John Rogers for finishing the translation of the Bible into English. John Rogers, minister of the gospel in London, was the first martyr in Queen Mary's reign. 
He was burnt in 1554. Now listen to this. His wife, with nine small children and one at her breast, followed him to the stake with which sorrowful sight he was not in the least daunted, but with wonderful patience died courageously for the gospel of Jesus Christ. What they did is they put his wife and his nine children in front of him. And then they went to John Rogers and said to him, John Rogers, you want to come down from that stake and join your family, your wife and your nine little children? One thing you have to do. Here. Here. The host, the consecrated host. Say to us that this is the real body of Christ, the real presence, and not just a symbol, and you can come down and join your family. What did John Rogers do? Set it alight, and he died. What did Protestantism just do? signed a document agreeing to Roman Catholic doctrine. That's what they did. Hebrews 10 verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. One sacrifice forever. Jesus Christ doesn't have to be sacrificed over and over and over again. Joint document. Now listen to this. Catholics and Lutherans agree that the church on earth is united with the community of the saints in glory. What? Communion between Christ's saints on earth and Christ's saints who have already died. We believe in the fundamental indestructibility of life given us in Christ. The communion in Christ into which human beings are called endures also in death and judgment. This solidarity across the barrier of death is particularly evident in the Eucharist, which is always celebrated in unity with the host of heaven. The apparent division marked by death melts away. I'm going to have another heart attack. Lutherans and Catholics agree in this document that when they say the sacrament of the Mass, the dead come and join the celebration. That's what they just agreed to. That's what they agreed to. What does spiritualism teach? Here's a spiritualist webpage. They believe God exists, but they believe in the immortality of the soul. They also believe in reincarnation, different worlds, community with the spirits, and there's a morality. What does the Bible teach? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Bible teaches in 1 Timothy that the king, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. In other words, the only one who is immortal is God. And then the Bible teaches, till heaven be no more, they shall not awake nor be raised of their sleep, Job 14 verse 12. Then the Bible says in Psalms 115 that the dead praise not the Lord, neither say any that go down into silence. So how can they take part in the Mass and celebrate if they don't know anything? So I believe this. Rust in peace. <laughs> the Bible says, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Here are three doctrines that come from the devil. Number one, you will not die. Number two, you will be as gods. And number three, you will be able to distinguish between good and evil. All three are official Roman Catholic doctrine. I don't have time to go into it. I've got a whole lecture on it in one of my previous lectures, where I clearly show that they say that you become a god, and where they clearly state that you determine what is right and wrong, but only the shepherd can do that for you, namely the Pope. Let's just make sure. This is the official catechism of the Catholic Church, and it says, the Church, not the Bible, teaches that every spiritual soul is immortal. It does not perish when it separates from the body at death. 
The church teaches that. Now, if this is ignorance, then fine. But does this church know what the Bible teaches? Let's ask them. This is the New Catholic Encyclopedia. The soul in the Old Testament means not a part of man, but the whole man as a living being. Similarly, in the New Testament, it signifies human life, the life of an individual conscious object. Recent exegetes have maintained that the New Testament does not teach the immortality of the soul in the Hellenistic sense of survival of an immortal principle after death. So Rome says, we teach you are immortal, the Bible teaches you are not. They know. Now what did Martin Luther believe? Pope Leo was reacting to the people that were beginning to believe that the soul sleeps. And he issued this bull in 1513. This is before the Reformation. We do condemn and reprobate all who assert that the intelligent soul is mortal. Martin Luther then translated the Bible after 1517. And he realized that the Bible teaches soul sleep. And he had some nice words to say about this papal bull. He said the following. The Pope's immortality declaration is among those monstrous opinions to be found on the Roman dunghill of Decretals. He had such a nice way with words. This is what he believed. Now remember, this is the man who translated the Bible. Luther espoused the doctrine of the sleep of the soul upon a scripture foundation and then made use of it to confutation of purgatory, saint worship, and, the continued, and he continued in that belief till the last moments of his life. Here's a quote from Martin Luther. We should learn to view our death in the right light so that we need not become alarmed on account of it as unbelief does. Because in Christ it is indeed not death but a fine, sweet, and brief sleep which brings us relief from this veil of tears from sin and from the fear and extremity of real death and from all the misfortunes of this life. And we shall be secure and without care, rest sweetly and gently for a brief moment as on a sofa until the time when he shall awaken us together with all his dear children to eternal glory. And since we call it a sleep, we know that we shall not remain in it but be awakened and live and that time during which we sleep shall seem no longer as when we just fallen asleep. And hence we shall censure ourselves that we were surprised or alarmed at such sleep in the hour of death and suddenly come alive out of the grave from decomposition, entirely well, fresh and pure, with glorified life, meet our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ in the clouds. Scripture everywhere affords such consolation. That's what Martin Luther believes. That's what I believe. That's what Seventh-day Adventists believe. Question, who's the better Lutheran now? The Seventh-day Adventist or the Lutheran that now believes papal doctrine again? They don't believe what Luther said. Now, who's the other man who translated the Bible? Tyndall. He must have mulled about the meaning of these words when he translated it. What did he say? Well, he argued with Thomas More, the Catholic prelate, about this very is issue. And he said, in the words of More, all, slow, all souls lie and sleep till doomsday. In 1530, Tyndall responded vigorously, saying, And ye, Thomas More, putting them, the departed souls in heaven, hell, and purgatory, Destroy the argument wherewith Christ and Paul prove the resurrection. And again, if the souls be in heaven, tell me why they be not in as good case as the angels be. And then what is the cause there for the resurrection? And then he gets a little bit sarcastic and he says, Nay, Paul, you are unlearned. Go to Master Moore and learn a new way. We are not most miserable, though we rise not again, for our souls go to heaven as soon as we be dead, and are there in as great joy as Christ that is risen again. And I marvel that Paul had not comforted the Thessalonians with that doctrine, if he knew of it. I'm paraphrasing it for you. That the souls of their dead should rise again. If the souls be in heaven, in as great joy as the angel after your doctrine, 
then show me what cause there should there be of a resurrection. So the two Bible translators saw it as soul sleep. And that was Protestantism in the beginning, but Protestantism moved back to Catholicism. And now they put it in a joint document that they're celebrating the Eucharist, the literal sacrifice with the dead. Let's compare the King James Version and the NIV regarding this little word, liturgos. This gets interesting. Romans 15, 16, King James. That I should be a minister, liturgos, of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering, irugeo, the gospel of God. Look what the new translations do. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, he gave me the priestly duty. Oops. We've now become priests, according to the new translation. Let's just make sure about their joint document. Catholic theology, in Catholic theology, the ordained minister is sacramentally empowered to act in the name of Christ as well as in the name of the church. Catholic theology is convinced that the office of bishop makes an indispensable contribution to the unity of the church. Catholics raise the question of how, without the Episcopal office, church unity can be maintained in times of conflict. Luther's particular doctrine of the common priesthood did not adequately maintain the church's hierarchical structure which are seen as divinely instituted. So in their joint document, they say, a Protestant priest wasn't quite up to it. He had to be something higher. He had to become a sacrificing priest. Okay. Lutherans and Catholics also agree on the responsibility of ordained leadership for the administration of the sacraments. Lutherans say the gospel bestows on those who preside over the churches the commission to proclaim the gospel, forgive sins, and administer the sacraments. I think I'm going to die again. I'll read that for you again. Their joint document. Lutherans say the gospel bestows on those who preside over the churches, that's the pastor, the commission to proclaim the gospel. I have no problem with that. To forgive sins? Hello? Can I forgive your sin? I'm an ordained minister. If I were to forgive your sins, then please kick me out of the church. At men of the, the sacrament, which they consider to be bound up with the Eucharist. This is total Catholicism. Has the Lutheran Church capitulated? Where does this nonsense come from? Well, we have to go to history. Ignatius of Antioch, I'm just going to speed through it. He's the first one in his letter. We encounter for the first time an ecclesiology which exalts one bishop over the rest of the presbytery. There was nothing like that in the early church. Here all of a sudden comes Ignatius of Antioch and he says no one person should be responsible. The next one was Irenaeus, and he started saying that the church is infallible, that this bishop is infallible. And he also developed the basis for Catholic Marian theology. So this is the next thing that came in. Then came Tertullian, and he next developed clarification. That is the distinction between clergy and laity. So the clergy is up here, and the laity is down there. Now let's read this carefully. Again, I'm going to be naughty because I'm going to compare the King James with the new translations. This is the first council in Jerusalem. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and the elders and the brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. So they came together for this great council to decide on circumcision, not circumcision, etc. Moses' law, not whatever. Who made the decision at that council? According to the King James, the apostles 
the elders, and the brethren. And let's look at the new translation. With them they sent the following letters. The apostles and elders, comma, your brothers, to the Gentiles. Who makes the decisions now? Just the leaders. So now you've gone from a church making a decision to a synod making a decision. And when you go even worse, you go to one man making a decision infallibly. So this is what came in. He made that distinction. And Rome, of course, has the ultimate distinction that one man is responsible. And then comes Cyprian, and he elevates the clerics to priests. And he claimed that the bishop is a sacrificing priest. This is not according to the gospel, but in the joint document, it is there. Let's read some more. This is in their document, Conflict to Communion. The Second Vatican Council reaffirms its understanding that bishops have been, by divine institution, taken the place of the apostles as pastors of the church in such wise that whoever hears them, hears Christ, and whoever rejects them, rejects Christ, and him who sent him. That's Catholic doctrine. One man will tell you what you must believe. Okay. okay. Finally, Catholics and Lutherans differ in both the office and authority of ministry. For Catholics, the Roman pontiff has full, supreme, universal power over the church. The College of Bishops also exercises supreme and full power over the universal church. Together with its head, the Roman pontiff, and never without this head. When Vatican II speaks of the church having an ultimate judgment... This clearly shows, eschews monopolistic claims. Thus, Lutherans and Catholics are able jointly to conclude. Therefore, regarding scripture and tradition, Lutherans and Catholics are in such extensive agreement that their different emphasis do not themselves require maintaining the present division. Okay, the, the pastor has become a priest and tradition they agree with the Roman Catholic Church. Excuse me, I thought that Protestantism said sola scriptura. But the Council of Trent said, no, tradition is the way in which scripture must be interpreted. And now they agree that tradition is fine? What happened to sola scriptura? Do we now have sola scriptura tradiciona? Revelation 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then in Revelation chapter 18, it tells us Babylon has fallen has fallen. She has become a house of demons, a house of every unclean and detestable bird. Come out of her, my people, that you receive not of her plagues. What does that mean? And here the scripture gives us an explanation of exactly what this union at the end of time will look like. And there are three components. The first component is the dragon component of Babylon. Because she had on her forehead written Babylon, the mother of all the churches. And she says, I will not suffer loss of children. My children will return unto me. And Ratzinger said, Protestants, you are not sisters of ours. You are children. You will return unto me, the mother. And she had on her forehead the name Mystery, Babylon. And in her hand she had a golden cup full of the abominations of her fornication. There's only one church in the whole world that has as its symbol the woman with a golden cup in her hand. You will find her when you walk into the Vatican, turn right and look into the first chamber, you will find the statue of the woman with a cup in her hand. But it's all in marble, so you can't see that it's gold. If you want to see it in gold, 
you go to the Galie del Jesu church, which is the chief church of the Jesuits, and you walk in there and you see the woman standing with a golden cup in her hand. Only one church that does that. And then it shows Protestantism being destroyed by this woman. And you see Martin Luther and Calvin reeling, and you see the kings of the world adoring her. If you want to know who this woman is, who will make an alliance with whom? With a dragon. Now we know who the dragon is because the Bible says that's the devil. That's all kinds of spiritism where the devil practices his religion. And spiritism teaches what? That the dead are alive and communicate with you. Has Catholicism and Protestantism made an alliance with the dragon and is teaching exactly that, yes or no? Yes. Then there is the beast. Well, the Reformers told us who the beast was. The beast is Catholicism. So there's an alliance between the dragon and the beast and then the mouth of the false prophet. How sad. Who's the false prophet who joins them in this alliance? Well, Revelation chapter 13, the second part, tells me who that power is. It is Protestantism that has fallen, that has fallen. Martin Luther said, if you give up the doctrine of justification, you are a fallen church. That's what Martin Luther said. You're a fallen church. So has Protestantism fallen, fallen, has she become part of this system? Then what do you have to do? You have to come out of her, my people. Now let's just see where this leading. And this is getting serious now. History is going to repeat itself. We read in Matthew that when Pilate saw that he could not prevail, but that a tumult was arising, he took water and he washed his hands. You know the story. And then he answered all the people and said, and they, they answered, the Pharisees, when he wanted to let him free, they said, His blood be on us and on our children. And he released to them Barabbas. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Because they'd stripped him, they'd put a scarlet robe on him, they put a crown of thorns, and they put a scepter in his hand, a reed. They as verily crowned him king with a mock robe and a mock scepter and a mock crown as though he was the greatest king ever to be inaugurated. But this is what happened. Pilate answered them, saying, Will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy, but the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas. And Pilate answered again and said, said unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil has he done? And, and they cried out all the more exceedingly, Crucify him! And Pilate tried to release him. And they said to him, If you let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. This is serious. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought forth Jesus and sat down in the judgment seat in a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king! They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Can you see how often this word king is re repeated? And the chief priests answered and said, Oh, we have no king but Caesar. In the Lutheran Roman Catholic conversation, a clear consensus has emerged that the doctrine of justification and the doctrine of the church belong together. The church is going to be your sanctifier, not Jesus. 
This is a very serious statement in that document. Because that they believed they belonged together to one body of Christ, Lutherans emphasized that their church did not originate with the Reformation or come into existence only 500 years ago. It was just a movement. We're going back to Rome. They wanted to reform the church. They managed to do so within their field of influence, although with errors and missteps. The error was with the Lutherans. It is clear that the division of the body of Christ is opposed to the will of the Lord. We're going to become one. As Lutheran Christians and congregations, they said in 1970, we apologize. We are truly sorry for the offense and misunderstanding which these polemic elements have caused our Roman Catholic brethren. Let me just go to, we have no king but Caesar. Who was Caesar? You know, history is fascinating. Listen to this. As the power of Rome expanded into many parts of Greece, Attalus, the last king of Pergamos, died in the year 133 BC, and he left in his will all the dominions of Pergamos to the Roman people. Thus the kingdom of Pergamos was merged into the dominions of Rome. However, for some years there was no one who could openly lay claim to all the dignity and powers inherent in the title of the kings of Pergamos, namely that of sovereign pontiff. The powers of the Roman pontiffs were therefore somewhat restricted. Let me tell you the history. Pergamos was founded by the priests of Babylon when Medo-Persia conquered Babylon. The priests of Babylon fled and established Pergamos in a fortress. And there the high priest, who was a god-man, a sacrificing priest, was the Pontifex Maximus, who was the officiating priest, and he was a god to be worshipped. The Medo-Persians never conquered Pergamos. The Greeks then took over by the, the Medo-Persians, but they never conquered Pergamos. And then the Romans took over, and they never conquered Pergamos. But then Pergamos capitulated in the year 133, and the last king, Attalus, gave his title his vestments, and his authority as a gift to Rome. And the early emperors took the title Pontifex Maximus, and they took the robe, but they weren't so arrogant as to take the title God. Until you get to Julius Caesar. Let's just read. It was from Julius Caesar's name that the Roman emperor took their title Caesar. Caesar also held the position of Pontifex Maximus. Who holds that position today? Julius Caesar was elected to the position of Pontifex Maximus in the year 63 BC. So basically he was the Babylonian pontiff and was the true legitimate successor of Belsassar. He was declared to be Jupiter's incarnation on the 25th of December, 48 BC, in the temple of Jupiter in Alexandria. There are signs that in the last six months of his life, he aspired not only to a monarchy in name, as well as in fact, but also to a divinity which the Romans should acknowledge. Listen carefully. The Romans, as well as the Greeks, the Orientals, and the barbarians. This is history. Who had to acknowledge, acknowledge his deity? The whole world. And he was Caesar. And he was a god. And the early Christians refused to worship the Caesars. And what did they do to them? They threw them to the lions. They killed them. They refused to worship the Caesars. Revelation 2.12, let's just make sure. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write, These things says he which has the sharp sword with the two edges, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. If you represent the king of Pergamos, you, are, you have whose seat? Satan's seat. Now this must be the most arrogant picture ever put out by the papacy. The papacy in writing lays claim to the position of deity. But the present pope is sitting here on a great white throne 
between two cherubs with four living creatures surrounding him. Where do I find that description in the Bible? And I saw a great white throne and he that was seated on it. And the Bible says, he who is seated between the cherubs. And Ezekiel describes the vision of the throne of God. And he says, there were four living creatures surrounding the throne. He who is enthroned between the cherubs. What is he in type laying claim to with this picture? That is God. So when we capitulate to this man, the one who says we need to call for a new ecologic economic order, I saw one of the heads of it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed. It's healed. It's healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And if you do that, you are worshipping the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, which is Catholicism. And they worship the beast because you're obeying it saying who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with them. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings. And he said, See you not all these things? Verily I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And this destruction of Jerusalem became a literal fact. This is a type of the destruction at the end of time. The Jews were the heralds of the gospel. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stones them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wing, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Desolate. Now, my question is this. The Jews said, we have no king but Caesar. Did probation close for them at the cross? Yes or no? No. God in his mercy didn't make probation close at the cross. Because if you study the prophecy of Daniel 9, that was in the middle of the week when the cross took place. And Jesus said to his disciples, Go ye first to the lost children of Israel. And the disciples only preached the gospel to the Jews, to no one else, until the stoning of Stephen, three and a half years later. And Paul was standing there, and he was looking on as they were stoning Stephen to death. And as he was on the road to Damascus, he saw the, the light, and he got the commission to be the apostle to whom? To the Gentiles. And at the same time, Peter is having a vision of unclean sheet coming down and he's told, go Peter, eat. And he says, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean in all my life. Do not call unclean what God has made clean. While I was thinking about the vision, three people knock on the door and three Gentiles stand outside, which would have horrified a Jew. And he goes with them and he comes to Cornelius and he says, you know that it is unlawful for me as a Jew to associate with one of the Gentiles. But God has shown me in vision that I must not call any man unclean or impure. So the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Probation closed for the Jews as a nation. Not as individuals because Paul says they can be grafted in again. They just have to accept salvation in Christ. My question is this. When the Protestant world on the 31st of this month celebrates the unity with the Roman Catholic Church and accepts the principle of apostolicity, isn't it saying we have no king but Caesar? Isn't it saying that then? Now, that's not the close of probation for this world, so we're not going home on the 31st of October, okay? Relax. But there will be certain people that will say, excuse me, you can't do this because this is not biblical. And they will say, you, you are troublers of Israel. You fundamentalists. 
will have to get rid of you. And people will have to make a decision. Who am I going to believe? Am I going to stick to the Bible and the principles of Protestantism? Or am I going to say, okay, I have no king but Caesar. He's the one that's going to give me salvation through apostolic successional power. Well, destruction comes thereafter when they pick up the antitypical stone to stone the antitypical Stephen that is a thorn in their flesh. When they make true that threat, whether you are Christian or whether you are Muslim or whether you are Marine, you have to be what? Eliminated. That's when God will intervene. And that time Michael will stand up the great prince which stands for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even at the same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered everyone that is found written in the book. It's a promise. And I want to end with this. Hebrews 11. He talks about Moses. By faith. Ah, oh, by faith. Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. For in just a little while he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but by my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Are we going to fear the, the wrath of the king? Or are we going to say, my trust is in the righteousness of Christ. I am saved by his righteousness. He is the one who imputes it to me. He is the one who imparts it to him. By his stripes I am healed. By his blood I am saved. No system is going to get into my way. There is only one way to be saved. And that is by the blood of the Lamb. Who is going to make that decision? You don't have much time. Think about it. And may God give you the grace when the time comes to make that decision. Now I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm considered a sect. Why? Because I believe in the mortality of the soul. So did Martin Luther. So did Tyndall. So I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Lutheran to the bone. When it comes to that doctrine, I believe in justification by faith and faith alone. But I also believe in obedience. And tomorrow we're going to talk about the issue which is going to play a central role in this final conflict. And it is so important that we understand the whole picture. Because how do I demonstrate to the world that I stand for righteousness by faith? How do I demonstrate it? May God help us as we make these decisions and may this country wake up to the dire situation in which we are presently standing before the very threshold of the close of probation. When the Gentile world says we have no king but Caesar, the end is knocking at the door. May God bless you. Thank you.